basically this is planting a flag because as time goes on, you forget how you were thinking in the past. And uh, yeah. so it might be fun to, to look back on. And it also might be interesting to share with people who are thinking about coming into HVAC 2.0 today because um, they're not going to be following the same path you followed. Um, it's yeah. very clear that that people coming in today are going to have to come in through the free quote. They're not going to get a whole lot of coaching, but I don't think they're going to need it based on uh, Jason's. I mean, do you even recall? Well, I guess we'll start at the beginning and then ask if you recall how much training it took and to get up to speed and how, how that went. Um, so Tanner, tell us a little <laughs> bit about background about yourself, please. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess quick rundown of my background and kind of what I've done is just, uh, I've been in the HVAC industry for now. Uh, let me think going on eight years, eight and a half years total. And that's, I'm basically from the time that I first walked into my first HVAC class at a local college till now. So, okay. you know, that's including a lot of what you really probably wouldn't consider time in the industry, but for you went straight to trade school out of high school. Yes. Yeah. Went to a local college. They had an HVAC program and chose to go that route. So went into that and that was, and from the time I first walked in till actually working in the field was like a year after that. So it was, I was still in the course, but I went into the field pretty quickly. And so the, as far as the type of work I've done, I started out in just a residential, a small residential company, only a handful of technicians that worked there. We did a little bit of black commercial, but it was mostly residential focused. And then I worked for another company that did most, uh, primarily commercial. It was heavy light commercial. Uh, we did like restaurant equipment, hot and cold side. So worked on a bunch of different types of equipment. You got there. a lot of broad experience right out of the gate. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's that, awesome. Yeah. That particular company. I, I mean, I've worked, I worked on things that were like laboratory equipment at, you know, uh, health centers for to all the way to deep fryers and a church's chicken, like <laughs> everything in between. And so that was good experience. And then I've worked at a, well, the same college that I went to, I worked there as well. And so then I kind of got some more uh, heavier commercial type stuff with, you know, chillers with controls and, and that type of thing. And so then when I started doing work on my own, I was primarily just residential lot commercial. That was kind of the area that I was in and really was more geared towards, uh, I guess, higher end work initially. Like that was what the draw was. It was, you know, solving complex problems, that sort of thing. And uh, really the, the reason that I decided to do it on my own was the fact that I was working for companies who I just felt like nobody did good work, that it was just a, you get in, Hurry up you, get and get it done. Yeah, you get it working or you swap the box and you go on to the next one. Okay. And I just kind of didn't like it. Even the commercial company that I worked for, it's like, I, you know, I would want to try to throw out some ideas of like, Hey, what if we, you know, try to branch into this, start to do this and blah, blah, blah. And it was just constant, con which if you're the new guy and you're throwing out ideas, like you sound dumb. Right. Right. regardless and so they're shut you know, up they're, youngin shut yeah. up youngin yeah. and i mean those were and they were dumb ideas anyways it's just i right. knew i knew i wanted change i just didn't know what that change was supposed to look like right. and so so yeah that's the the high points of my background okay and then how did you come across hvac 20 so i had talked back and forth on some facebook groups with nate uh just general discussion of things and i met nate in person at the very first hvac symposium event down in o orlando i basically just was like hey that sounds like a thing to go to so i just drove down there by myself i didn't know anybody and went to that and there was a lot of like home performance building science -y related classes that were going on and it just kind of worked out because there was that was what i was interested in and i didn't know much about it but then in sitting in those classes, I basically walked away from those classes going, oh, so basically it sounds like nobody really has like 
a way of doing anything. It's just a bunch of information. Like I sit in one class that was talking about uh, VOC uh, off gassing of building materials. And it never, like he never really went into how do you build a house that's supposed to be ideal in the way that he views it. It was just this laundry list of all these problems and no solutions. And so I went into the class going, oh, if I'm going to deal with new construction or if I was going to build a house, like this is going to be something that'll help me in that. And then I right. what do I do oh, to, to solve this problem? But yeah. I mean, I guess you got to start with having clear understanding of the problem. Yeah. So and, it's good that they're that they were telling you. Oh, yeah. Help me really clarify how big the problem is, too. Right. Yeah. And so I walked out of that class going, OK, so basically just don't build a new house or have two million dollars set aside so you can build a fifteen hundred square foot house. One of the two. There is no in between. Right. Um, they didn't so, say just mix yeah. and evacuate and yeah and so at that event i met nate in person and uh we talked a good bit just talked about different things you know i was asking him some questions yada yada and at that point i was already had a blower door kind of on the radar to get it's just it wasn't a, really immediate like i wasn't like had a hard day to go oh i need a blower door it was okay. just i've heard about it and i feel like i should get one but i just don't know yet i didn't understand the concept of uh, the infiltration being useful for load calcs. I just seen it as a building diagnostic tool. And so that was kind of the, at that time of the year, that's where it was. And probably three months after that is when I bought a blower door. And then what prompted, so it was building and building and building. What eventually caused you to pull the trigger? Um, well, Talking with Nate and hearing about the comfort consult ish, which at that time, my mind was viewing it as a, here's a technical process for just solving problems. Like that was just, I was thinking this is going to be just pure technical. You know, it's how do I take all this stuff that I've just heard from all these other people that didn't give me any guidance? Like this is the guidance to that. That's how I, I viewed it. And so I just went, oh, well, it sounds like this lower door is something that's needed. And it's, you know, a tool I was willing to spend money on tools. So, you know, a few months from there, I bought my blower door. And then a few months after that is then when I first joined uh, 2.0 for the first time. And so that was what, maybe a six month span from the symposium to uh, joining with 2.0. Okay. And do you recall, so people say that it's sort of hard to get into 2.0. And I'm not sure through, through various times we have sort of been more open or more closed. And at the time that you came in, um, what was going on and, and how hard was it? Um, hmm. I guess it depends on how somebody would define being uh, hard or not, because there was definitely a learning curve, but I was, I was really going into it of basically going, okay, whether or not I stay, this may not be worth it, it may not, or it may be worth it, or it may not, but it's gonna be a learning experience nevertheless. So that's was the main part. So I'm like, I've already got this tool. I know that's useful, whether I'm using it here and there. And so I was just like, well, it sounds like they have a method of doing this. So I'm gonna go into this and I'm just gonna learn their method. And if I don't like it, well then I can bail out and then I can use what I learned from this and I can just make my own if that's what it ends up being. And so that was really my mindset in going into it. Um, that sounds like a pretty free, reasonable mindset. I'm going to yeah. take, I'm going to take whatever value I can get out of this and, you know, maybe I'll stay or maybe I won't. Yeah. And but I mean, it was rooted. Yeah. It was a real mindset that was rooted in like a, you know, martial arts or like tactical training of just, you know, going through that stuff. I've always just been taught that, you know, when you learn from somebody, you go in as if you know nothing, or even if you feel like you're an expert in the topic, you right. master their method, and then you can reflect and go, okay, what do I like and what do I don't like? So that was just my Master their method. In. I like that. Master their method. And, and we we run across a lot of people that are, that people that don't seem to work out well for HVAC 2.0 are the ones that want to come in and, and tweak and change things and don't understand that the process is sacred and that until you've mastered the method, 
you're not qualified to tweak the method because you don't understand like the impact, the butterfly wing effect, right? You don't understand yeah. the impact of tweaking all of the different aspects all the way down the line. Whereas you do because you've mastered it. And so you can understand like if I'm, if I shift this, then, then all these other things shift and they shift in a good way instead of, uh, you know, I want to be lazy. So I'm going to shift this and then everything shifts in a bad way. And like, well, you screwed yourself here. Yeah. Well, I think it's a, I think it's a, a difference in perspective. Like the if you're military going to, mindset. Yeah. If you're going to learn something that you don't understand, then the whole goal should be that you're, you're not gaining skills, but you're also gaining a different perspective. And so if you're not willing to just go a hundred percent in and go, Hey, person that I'm learning from, tell me how I should be viewing this and how should I be, you know, what, what's the, the steps of mastery and learn that if you can't do that, you never gain that perspective. You always are going to stay in your one little lane, your perspective. that one narrow mindset, that one perspective. And you can't really get much from staying there. I mean, it's, you know, even if there's, if, if you're training jujitsu and you have somebody that they're showing you a technique, but you're in the back of your mind, you're going, Oh yeah, but you know, I do it a little bit differently. So I'm just going to kind right. of continue doing it my own way. Well, you're never going to learn. You're always going to be a white belt. Yeah. You're always going to, whatever, however good that you currently are at that point, that particular technique, you're always going to be that good. You're never going to be any better. But if you're willing to go, okay, well, I'm going to forget what I know. And hey, person, you know, hey, person that's teaching me, I'm going to learn your way and I'm going to try to get good at that. And then in that perspective shift, you might go, oh, wow, like there's a few details that I was doing that are not very efficient. It could be improved drastically. And now that I've learned this other method, I can now merge the two and refine what I already have. But mm -hmm. if you can't, you know, open yourself up for a different perspective, that's completely off the table. You'll never get there. But that was kind of my initial, you know, thoughts into coming into 2.0 of just, hey, I'm going to learn whatever I can learn. And if it don't pan out, then I can take whatever lessons I learned from there and do something else but it just started really opening up doors of because when I went into it it was purely technical that was really all I was interested in that was all I was focused in I didn't understand the human interaction portion of it of you know what people would call sales of just understanding people's problems and being able to have that conversation I didn't understand that part you know I didn't understand that hey eventually you can't do everything yourself. You're going to have to have somebody else to do it for you. And so if you only have a super complex process of doing things, you can never scale. And so there was like all these other layers that started kind of clicking for me that I was going, Oh, okay. I see this. I could see this being a problem in the future. Oh, I can see this being a problem in the future. And so it just kind of snowballed from there of just, you know, diving into more things. And so it in seems the, yeah. like you're starting to go into that next question is what, what it, what it's, what it has meant to you. Yeah. I think what it has meant to me has probably changed kind of throughout because initially it meant just a, you know, a, a method of learning is what it, all it was. And then it shifted to a, you know, a method of learning things that I didn't know I needed to learn. And then it shifted from that to going, oh, well, now it's a useful software that could potentially be used to help train somebody else who I might be sending out rather than me do all the work. And it can open up the door for repetitive results, things where I can go, okay, if we run into this situation, I can send this person out. They can follow this you know, process. They can follow this checklist step by step, and we can get repeatable results. And it so is, are you talking about comfort consult or, or free quote? Initially comfort consult. That's what you were, you were thinking how you train, train somebody on comfort consult. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, obviously things have kind of like everything was re really fluid. And so it was like constantly changing of, you know, the things that I thought were important kind of shifted quite a bit because at first it was like, oh, well, comfort consults are that, like, that's the, the gold nugget. Like that's what's needed. That's what's that's what we got to really sell. Change. Everyone has to be a comfort consult. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was just the mindset was purely 
how do we get more of those? And then how can I scale that to where I'm not having to do every single one of those? Okay. And then, you know, just through our process of how we've kind of changed things and improved 2.0 and added different things, that's again, obviously has changed even more so because now it's just a, I guess to me, it is, I would probably say just a better understanding of doing good repeatable work and not having to be the person that does everything each step of the way. So if you were going to train, a, if you were going to hire an assistant, <laughs> would you be comfortable sending them out? With little training, yeah. How, I mean, how much... Could, what 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 would the training consist of? Do you think? Well, it would be. I, I think I would divide it up, obviously, because you know I think I mean it's going to start with the person that answers the phone when somebody calls in, or the person that responds to the, you know, the email or the text or however you're getting a lead in. Um, and I think it's just kind of is just a analyzing what the foundation of the business is going to be like how does this business operate like what's the root thing of doing things and so having everybody on the same page there of from the csr from the person that's taking that call to okay they want a free quote to being able to send out somebody who you know doesn't have to be just a building science genius to go out and to be able to offer really good recommendations and to offer things that people can choose that can lead to really good rep uh, repetitive work that you can do at scale for a profit. Okay. And what do you think the HVAC 2.0 is going to mean to you going forward? Um, well, right now I feel like it's just, it's going to be that it's going to be the, really the ability to, um, I guess be operate in a very efficient capacity in terms of leads and in terms of scaling that. And obviously things have changed in between now and the past. And so I foresee it changing in an unforeseen way again, but currently I can see it being, Hey, we, I can send out, you know, if, if I get a hundred leads, I can send out somebody that doesn't have to be a superstar and get really good results with those leads, I can be really efficient with those leads. Okay. And, you know, turn those leads into, you know, I mean, good jobs and profitability to where if the, you know, if the industry standard is that, hey, for every sold lead, you know, it's called, it costs you $600 in order to get a lead, sell it and make money. Well, if, if I can cut that down by, you know, 50%, we can instead of spending $600 per lead, if I can spend only $300, well, that just frees up more additional money to funnel to other things. And if things get tough, if we go into a hard recession, I mean, if you're a business set up in that way, you're going to be the one that has the competitive advantage. The ability to survive. Yes. So what are your thoughts on the free quote process <clears throat> and how it, how do, you, how do you think it's changed how you think of the comfort consult? Well, let's step back. You were talking to me a little bit about your um, ratio of comfort consult to free quote earlier. Yes. Yes. So, so far, and it should be, you know, pretty predict, uh, predictable given that I was really heavy into comfort consults early on. I kind of seen that as the golden nugget. I was really like 50-50. 50% we're going comfort consult, 50% we're going free quote. And that was purely because my bias and, you know, I was leaning towards comfort consults as it was, I viewed that as the, you know, what was really, that was the valuable thing. That's what's in the Those were creating the fun jobs. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And it was allowing to kind of dig into things a little more because, you know, with the free quote. Help I mean, people that had problems and other people couldn't solve. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you're you're giving the okay to be able to do that to yeah. work with a free quote. If they're not giving you anything, you're not guaranteed anything. I mean, you just waste, you will waste so much time if you try to do that and not be paid for it for multiple reasons on multiple levels that 
It's just, it was basically, do I put in very minimal effort in going free quotes or do I get to put in a lot of effort and do things that are more enjoyable with the comfort consults? And that's before we got the free quote to where it is now, that was really what that felt like. So that's why I was really, you know, in that. Right. 50, 50 so free quotes sort of felt and, and I, <clears throat> so the fact that we didn't have a process for you guys when you ran free quotes and we just sort of said, you got to run free quotes the way you have always run free quotes. Um, I'm glad that's over because it felt a little bit like abandonment. Yeah. And, I mean, it, and but we had to, we had to get fixed what we had to get fixed before we could lean into fixing this. Yeah. I mean, I think the, I think the way that that kind of came about, I feel like it was necessary because for me in understanding the comfort consult and understanding like what the, you know, comprehensive planning process, like what those offer, what they do and what that looks like. I feel like that was very valuable and in understanding the results those yield and how those come about, I felt like was necessary in order to, I guess, really understand the value of the free quote and to really shape the free quote to how it turned out. Yeah. Because, I mean, it was really the results of a lot of comfort consults was really what shaped the free quote into being what it was Absolutely. just because of patterns. Like we started recognizing, Hey, you know, we're seeing this, 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 and this consistently. And so yeah. can we do that in a more efficient way? Can we eliminate steps and still or get shift the same results? Shift yeah. them like we're doing right now with like the load range, um, yeah. yellow, red, we're going to be able to move the blower door to after the replacement of the equipment. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it, and then being able to do that, if you can do less steps, you can do, it requires less effort. It requires less work. It's freeing up so much more money there that you can either, you know, spend that money towards other things you can, if times get tough, you can lower your prices and still be just as profitable as you were before. If you were doing all those extra things, it's just, it opens up a whole lot more and then it made it to where in the free quote uh, process, we can go, Hey, like, sure. We're going to have to make some assumptions here, but if you're willing and you don't want to spend this extra money, like we can get pretty darn close and still stay true to the do no harm motto and do it in a way to where it's, you know, it, it doesn't put you in a, a fork in the road of going, okay, do we lean into this interview and this testing or do we just do absolutely nothing? Because that's what initially that fork felt like when offering, you know, a comfort consult to a client or a prospect was, hey, do you want me to do a lot of work and we solve problems or do you want to tell me what's what you want and I'll give you a quote? Right. Nothing in between. Nothing like. Yeah. Right? So what we just so everybody knows at this point, we're viewing the free quote process as um, a service that helps homeowners develop their perfect equipment specification. And that doesn't mean perfect without budget. That means perfect fitting their budget yes and this helping them understand spot. risks that they're that they're assuming that they've always assumed in the past but i don't think anybody articulated those risks to them so the the feedback is that homeowners are really happy with this process because they they're educated and they get to understand and choose their risks as opposed to just yeah, finally getting hit in the back of the head with that stuff if things don't go right. Yeah, well, I mean, traditionally, it it wasn't that uh, the risk wasn't there or that the homeowners were just you know told like they weren't given the option. It's just it was assumed that oh the contractor is going to just assume all risk. Right, and when that risk comes back to bite you, you just take whatever that lump sum of loss is and you divide it up and you sprinkle it across all of your paying customers. Right. Say, or which, or you just 
send somebody out to that that customer and pretend like you changed the dip switch until the customer gets tired of calling you. Oh, yeah. Those dip switches don't solve the problem. Yeah. A lot of people I mean, are just living with these problems thinking that they just can't be solved. Yes. And I mean, at the end of the day that, I mean, it's all going to come back around because if somebody's going out to go yeah. flip a dip switch, somebody's paying for it. And so it's either right, a, right. either a, the, the business goes out of business because they keep eating that cost or the business stays in business and just goes, Oh, we have, oh, we lost X amount of dollars this year because of all these warranty calls and because of all these problems we're just going to have to bump up our prices X amount to compensate for that. Right. So it, either way, somebody's paying for it. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's always the, the consumer. Oh yeah. Yeah. And either money or headache, one of the two. Well, Tanner, thank you very much. Is there anything that um, I forgot to ask you or anything that you'd want to say at this point? Um, let me think. Actually, there is one thing uh, in regards to kind of putting the free quote into perspective of how I've kind of begun to view it is that, you know, if you're a contractor who you want to do good work and you want to be able to do it in a way that feels ethical, you want to do it in a way that you don't have to go and feel like you're twisting arms to force people to buy the thing that you think they need, um, I've kind of started viewing the free quote process as being like a first level of a multi-level like system of solving problems. And so like being, being the first level is that that's the catch all for most things. Like you're going to, you're going to do really good work at this first level most of the time. And it does it in a way to where it can articulate the risk. It can articulate, you know, if you're going to, assume things where it's better to assume in, you know, okay, well, we're not sure exactly what size you need, but we're, for, we feel more comfortable leaning smaller than we do larger for reasons X, Y, and Z. And since we've looked at these key points, you know, you can look at this and determine what you would like to do. And so it kind of, for the most part, you're going to give people really good equipment. They're going to be really happy and you're going to solve a lot of problems with that first level. But if things kind of go a little sideways, you've got that next level of the comfort console. And given the way the free quote is set up and if, you know, you don't veer off and you don't, you know, royally screw up. Yeah, TCIS, right? Yeah, you should be in a good position to where if things still aren't quite right at the comfort console, you can unveil things that will then fit, that will then catch the things that get past level one. So if we're thinking of it in terms of filters, sure that first level filter, it might not have caught everything, but that next one is gonna catch basically the rest of that. That's going to be the, you know, hey, you didn't get a big airdrop return. And so that's why we're seeing this, this, and this. So now we can upgrade again and, you know, solve some of these problems. Or, you know, you didn't have to do filtration. Console and do zonal testing because that one room seems to still be a problem. Yeah. And so all, there's all these other little things that will get caught at that next level. And if for some reason you come across this, that one crazy basket case house, that it's just a, hey, you've got to do shell work. There is no if, ands, or buts about it, or you need to move, then that's where the CPP can catch it. And right. so it's these multiple levels of, if you run into a problem, it's going to get caught if it is worth it to them. It's just, at what point does it get caught? And in doing it properly, the homeowner's not going to be pointing fingers and mad at you through the whole way because they're going to understand, hey, you know, we were... You helped me understand this so yes. clearly. And I mean, the gratitude that you guys are getting when you go out and see people, just how come nobody else explained this stuff to me seems to be at every visit. Oh, yeah. yeah. Why didn't I mean, the that, other people tell me about any of this? Oh, yeah. That's, I mean, that's been the, the most common uh, response to really any of it has always been a, like, why doesn't everybody do this? Like, that's just the, like it, to them, they look at it and they go, this seems so easy and so straightforward and obvious that I can't understand why you're the only person I've ever seen do this. That's their. We don't part. want everybody doing it because yeah. it is competitive advantage after <laughs> all. Yeah. But I mean, but yeah. And so, and I feel like this, 
this the free quote process is really it's pulling a lot of value out of the comfort consult for free all the stuff that we learned in the comfort consult that we yes. put free <clears throat> yes free quote without it making the free quote significantly more work than people are already doing for free quote yes because i mean you're able to take a lot of information and process it so that way the customer can understand it that's really what we're doing we're just in the uh we're in the middle of information in the customer and just kind of being that middleman of going hey there's all this information i condensed it down and i made the bullet points of what you need to consider here you go what do you think and then they can read those high points and go, okay, I understand what's going on now. I understand the options, my house, the risk, blah, blah, blah. And I feel like it's probably best if I go this route and go from there. That's and awesome. That's how people feel. So how many, just to wrap up, you've gone from, you're, you're at 50-50 comfort consult because that's mm -hmm. the market that really appealed to you. Yeah. Where do you think you'll be at the end of this year do you think that that number will go down significantly it'll be be a lot more free quotes or do you think it'll how how will that shake out i think it's definitely going to change a lot i feel like i wouldn't be surprised if it's not 80 20 or even smaller wow just because now that i've done enough free i mean cut for consults on typical houses there's just been a you know a repetitive nature of going okay for this house it's going to be this equipment. If you buy good equipment, here's what we're getting. And so at the free quote process, if you opt to get what is likely to be the best, if that doesn't solve your problem, then the next step, odds are we're not having to touch this equipment ever again. Yeah. For the the words, right. It's, the, it's right. It's going to be fine. It's just, is there other looming things that we may have to do? You got to and redefine I, that attic or, or encapsulate that crawl space or some, some kind of like either obvious things or we need to do comfort consult and then maybe co comprehensive planning process if you want certainty. Yes. And uh, so, although and I don't know that people need a whole lot of certainty for basement encapsulation anymore, do they? I really don't think so. I feel like got to get the job done well is is the the big barrier. Yeah. Well, I mean, it just it comes down to like what's the point of the certainty? If we can achieve the results, does it matter if we were certain beforehand or not? Right. Uh, right. How did much you, are we willing you to know that you're going to save two hundred dollars a year in your energy bill, or yeah. or did you just know that there's a whole bunch of moisture down there that's going to make your house suck? Yes. Yes. And so let's, I mean, let's do something about it. Yeah. Right. And so it's like if, if you can predict a lot of potential high points that's going to cover 80 to 90 percent of cases, then why don't we just understand that, hey, this is only 80 percent, 80 to 90 percent of the time going to be right. And if it is within that 10 percent margin, well, then here's what we can do next. Do you want to spend money to know this into a science project? Yeah. Or do we just want to go ahead and do the things that we know we're going to have to do anyways? Right. And see if we don't have to spend that other money in the future. And most people are just going to be like, I really don't care. I want to get what I need right now. And I want to make the best assumptions I can and buy what I will need. And if I need something additional, well, then we'll go from there. But if not, then I don't want to even think about it. Well, thank you, Tanner. What's the name of your business and where are you located? Uh, Dickerson Services, and I'm located in uh, North Alabama. I'm based out of Gunnersville. And what's the phone number to reach you at? 256-557-4978. Uh, Thank you so much, buddy. Thank you.